Good afternoon, everyone. We're at just about at one o'clock, and so I think we'll begin today's program. Thank you so much for joining me for this first Saturday virtual history tour. My name is Ann Mason. I'm the executive director of the Plymouth Antiquarian Society, and I'm live streaming inside from the Hedge House on Water Street here in Plymouth. This tour is part of a virtual series being presented by the Plymouth Antiquarian Society and the Pilgrim Hall Museum. And we have some excellent tours. They're always excellent. We have some great new topics coming up in the next couple of months. So we will have a tour on the first Saturday of September, October, November, and December, um, starting at 1 p.m. So here is the list of the upcoming tours. And if you've missed any of our previous First Saturday tours, you can find them on the Antiquarian Society website. So the address is provided there, PlymouthAntiquarian.org slash first Saturday history tours. And instead of spaces, just use your hyphen first hyphen Saturday hyphen history hyphen tours. So that's how you can find all of the recordings for any programs that you may have missed. And this record, this program is being recorded and will be added to that site as soon as I have a chance to process it. Since we are streaming this to our Facebook page, if you have any questions, feel free to use the comment field to send those over to me. I um, will try to monitor, monitor them throughout the program. If I miss any, I will try to go back after the program and answer your questions. But also, you're more than welcome to send in comments and just say hello to each other. I know um, it's, it's, uh, it's part of the joy of doing a virtual program is to see where people are coming from. And um, I just love a chance to say hello to you back, um, even though we're separated by, by physical space. All right, so for today's, um, for well, for this year's tour series, we're exploring firsts in Plymouth history. And today we are going to explore the first immigrant neighborhoods in Plymouth and um, talk a little bit about early immigration to Plymouth. Now, Plymouth predominantly um, was English, remained English um, from the 17th century with the passengers of the Mayflower arriving in 1620, of course, and then later vessels arriving with English colonists and, um, and their descendants as well. So that there are a few notable exceptions in um, early Plymouth history. And I'm highlighting here the gravestone of um, Francis LeBaron, who was, um, this is his gravestone on Burial Hill, but he is, is known as Plymouth's first Frenchman. So he uh, ran aground in a French privateer um, in Buzzards Bay in 1694. And um, because he was a physician, he was allowed to stay in the Plymouth colony. Um, he eventually married Mary Wilder and he had a number of um, children and their children had children, so there are LeBarons um, in Plymouth ever since. So we do have some non-English um, colonists who arrive in Plymouth colony. Um, but really when we think about immigration, we're looking at the 19th century and the first really large non-English immigrant communities um, begin to appear in the middle of the 19th century. And um, from there, they change the face of the town. And this reflects what was happening elsewhere in the United States. So in the middle of the 19th century, we have, um, you know, sort of a, the taking off of the industrial revolution. And um, so we have immigrants coming in throughout um, throughout the country, um, but here in the Eastern Seaboard in particular, we have immigrants arriving in cities to work in the new in industries. And we sometimes, historians sometimes talk about push and pull factors when they talk about um, immigration. So we can talk about push factors, factors that push people out of their home country. And these are things like political unrest, economic troubles, famine. And so for the two leading um, groups of immigrants who come in the middle of the 19th century, from the 1840s, 1850s, um, they're, they're coming from Ireland. So actually the Irish is, is the largest group to come in the 1840s and 50s. And they are being pushed out of Ireland because of the potato blight and the subsequent famine. Most of the Irish immigrants who are coming in that period are, are poor and unskilled. 
Um, and then we also have a large group of immigrants coming from Germany. And one of the reasons for this is that in 1848, there's a revolution in Germany um, that fails. Um, many Germans who supported the revolution are fleeing. So it's sort of a political reason for leaving the country. Other Germans were looking for economic opportunities as well. So those are the factors that are pushing Irish and Germans out of their country. What is pulling them to the United States and what is pulling them to Plymouth? Well, as in elsewhere in, in the cities, as I mentioned, um, we have jobs here. So there are new factories, new businesses that are booming because of the industrial era. And so um, those immigrants are, are filling um, much needed uh, jobs. There, there are a lot of jobs opening up and the immigrants come to fill them. So how then do we actually find the immigrants that lived here in Plymouth? How, how do we know who they were? How do we know where they lived? So before we can even talk about the neighborhoods, how can we actually identify the immigrants and how many were here in Plymouth? So um, as I'm sure everyone knows, there is a federal census that is taken every 10 years. And um, the census is a really wonderful document to help us trace the growth of the town. And it can also help us um, pinpoint birthplaces um, in terms of you know, where were these residents of Plymouth in a given year, where were they actually born? And 1850 is the first census that actually does ask for the birthplace of the person, the people who are enumerated. Um, so if we look at Massachusetts and the entire population of Massachusetts in 1850, because we have the information from the census about whether someone's born in the United States or whether they were born in a foreign country, <clears throat> we can see that um, in Massachusetts in 1850, the total population was um, 994514, so just about 1 million people in Massachusetts in 1850 and 16.5% of them were um, born in foreign countries, born outside of the United States. So that's 164,024 people. Um, so you can see here on this chart, the number of um, people born outside of the United States is there in blue, 16.5%. Now, I actually had to um, read and, and skim through the 1850 census for Plymouth in order to um, gather some of this data. So that's 144 pages of um, census entries for the town of Plymouth in 1850. And we can see that there's actually a, a much smaller percentage of people born um, outside the United States in Plymouth when you compare it to Massachusetts as a whole. So in Plymouth, the total population in 1850 was 6,024 people. Um, and overwhelmingly, they recorded their birthplace as Massachusetts. So not even just born in the United States, but most of them were born in Massachusetts. Um, New England states also appear somewhat frequently. Um, you have a few states that um, pop up. So we know that there were 110 free colored as they're labeled in the census or our African Americans in 1850 in Plymouth, 110, and often their birthplace is listed as Virginia or Maryland. Um, so they may have um, become north out of slavery from there. But again, overwhelmingly, Plymouth residents are born in Massachusetts. You can see again that blue triangle is the number of people born outside of the United States, and that's only 359 of those 6,024 people. So that's only 5.9%. So Massachusetts as, as a whole in 1850, 16.5% um, immigrant uh, in Plymouth, the town of Plymouth is only 5.9%. So larger cities like Boston, um, Lowell, um, probably even Worcester, they're going to have a much uh, higher percentage of immigrants just because they're larger and they have more industries in 1850. Um, Plymouth is, is still in 1850 largely an agricultural community um, in many ways, although we do have had had since the 18th century a number of industries along the waterways and the waterfront and of course had a very um, busy commercial shipping um, uh, industry as well, and shipbuilding industry too. So um, Plymouth was, was, a, was certainly not a city like Boston, but it was a very busy place and it did provide opportunities for some of the immigrants who wanted to look for jobs here. 
So I further, I did a further breakdown by, by country, country of origin for those um, Plymouth residents in 1850. So this is a much more uh, complicated pie chart here. We have a lot more colors there. Um, but the interesting thing, the important thing to note is that Ireland, which is appropriately that beautiful light green color, um, that largest piece of the pie, so of the 359 people in Plymouth in 1850 born outside of the United States, 162 of them were born in Ireland. So that's 45% born in Ireland. And then next, that light blue triangle, we have 98 or 27% born in Germany. So again, reflecting the same trends that we're seeing nationally in terms of immigration patterns. Um, the next triangle, the yellow, is um, England with 36, and then Canada is the dark green with 24, and predominantly those 24 um, Plymouth residents who were born in Canada were born in the maritime provinces, so per Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, um, Newfoundland, and PEI. And then we have a dark blue triangle for Scotland, that's only 16 um, Scottish immigrants. Um, then next comes Wales with six, Denmark with five, France with three, Portugal with two, Cuba with one, Greece with one, and Spain with one. So um, obviously some of these um, are individuals, individuals coming without a family from a foreign country. Um, we also have, in many cases, it's one family that's coming from one of those countries that has smaller numbers. So um, they're not, um, you know, it's, it's often people are traveling with families and sometimes they're traveling individually. But as you can see from the pie chart, we have um, mostly Irish and German immigrants in Plymouth in 1850. I also want to note that the census has some sort of a couple of interesting tantalizing um, uh, it, things that I would love to follow up on at some point, but we have um, some very young children who are documented as, as have been as being born outside of the United States. Um, three of them are listed as, as being born in Honolulu, and one is listed as being born in the Sandwich Islands. And from what I can tell, I think um, they are actually um, probably the children of a sea captain or um, someone who, who you know, had some overseas venture and they were born while, while their parents were overseas in those places. So it's, it's sort of tantalizing. I'd, I'd love to find out more about those children. Um, so they're a little bit different because they don't think they were, they're not immigrating from another um, European country or from one of those places um, in search of a, a new opportunities or employment, um, but they're actually born while, while on an overseas voyage, it seems like. The other thing to remember about the census records is that, of course, a lot of the information could have been recorded incorrectly. So it's all being done um, by, by the, the enumerators of the census, the census takers, and they're um, writing down what they hear people say as they go household to household, door to door. Um, so often spelling in particular is not quite precise. Um, and sometimes, you know, they could have just written down the, the wrong thing. Maybe they missed heard the person, or perhaps they even um, could have um, given false information. So you never know, someone may not have wanted to, um, maybe they misunderstood the question that was being asked, or perhaps they, they did um, not necessarily want to share the whole truth of their story with um, the stranger who was taking a census for the federal government. So we, we have a pretty good sense of where people are coming from, but sometimes when you look at census records, you'll see that someone's birthplace might change between 1850 and 1860 when the next census is taken. And of course their birthplace didn't change, but the way that it was recorded changed. All right, so we have all these numbers and we get a sense of, of the immigrant population that was in Plymouth in 1850, um, but how do we know where they actually lived? If we're gonna talk about neighborhoods in Plymouth, well, unfortunately, uh, the census does not necessarily help us in that case uh, to answer that question because the census takers were listing people according to dwelling numbers. So they were um, assigning a number for every dwelling and then for every sort of household within that dwelling. And prior to the 1880 census, 
um, there weren't necessarily maps that accompanied all the all of the censuses. So for 1850, we don't have precise addresses and we don't necessarily know which dwelling the census taker was referring to um, when he took down that information. And so, it, you know, it is difficult to know precisely where individuals and families lived. Um, but we do know from other sources where some Plymouth families lived. And um, so we can sort of get a sense from that about where, where the other families lived based on where, how they were recorded the census. Now, again, this is not an exact science because there's no guarantee that the census taker, um, you know, went house to house to house to house along the street. Um, you know, there might've been a reason to skip a house, um, maybe no one was home, or they could have crossed the street and done houses on that side of the street. So it's 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 difficult to say for sure. But um, I'm going to share a little bit about what I what I think we can say um, based on my own research. Um, there are street directories that survive for some of the mid 19th century years in Plymouth. Um, there's an 1851 street directory. Um, but that also only offers limited help because it lists street names, but not numbers. And nearly all of the um, nearly all of the entries are for men, so the head head of the household, and they're nearly all English names. So not all of the people in Plymouth were um, recorded in the street directory. There's also an 1860 street directory. Um, of course, property records can help if you're trying to figure out where someone may have lived and who owned a certain house. But um, for most of our immigrant individuals and families, they um, were most likely renting. So it's not necessarily going to help us to look at a property record since that might tell us who owns the house, but not who actually lived in it. But let's begin. And one thing, um, the first thing I want to talk about is talk a little bit about the Irish population of Plymouth and, and their neighborhoods. And here we have um, an early photograph of the Hedge House which is now the Hedge House Museum on Water Street. This is actually a photograph taken in its original location on Court Street. So for those of you who didn't know, the Hedge House was moved in 1924 to save it from demolition by the Plymouth Antiquarian Society. Um, but previously to its location on Water Street, it was at 83 Court Street. And if you visit the house today, um, you can see the, the number 83 still on our front door. So why am I sharing a picture of the Hedge House when I'm talking about immigrant neighborhoods? Well, one of the um, most common sources of employment or um, fields of employment for Irish women was domestic um, service. So Irish women who, who immigrated here often worked as domestic servants for wealthy families. Um, and some of them would have lived in the same households with those families. If the house was large enough to have room for family and staff. And so what we learned from the census is that um, the members of Thomas Hedge's household, so in 1850, Thomas Hedge um, owned the Hedge house and um, was living there in Court Street with his family. And included in his household were two young Irish women, or two young women who were listed at, as their birthplace being Ireland. So um, Again, this is this is a, a copy of the census of 1850 for Plymouth, and it's it's not a very good scan, but fortunately, it's available to um, to us via Ancestry.com um, via subscription. So here we have the entry for Thomas Hedge. He's listed at the top, and um, he's he was 50 years old at the time. His wife Lydia is listed and then we have a number of his children who are still living at home at that time um, and then we have at the bottom the last two lines uh, Catherine O'Brien who was 20 years old and Ellen Welch who was 25 and then right across right next to the hedge house is the other Hedge House. <laughs> so Thomas Hedge lived next door to his brother, Isaac Lothrop Hedge, who lived at 81 Court Street. Um, and Isaac and um, Thomas were business partners. What's now Memorial Drive was actually known as Hedge Place at this time. And um, they, the, the Isaac Lothrop Hedge House is now the St. Peter's Parish Rectory. Um, but here's Isaac listed as a merchant. He was 51, his wife, Marianne, um, is listed, and then um, several of his children, 
Um, and then we see that, um, again, there are two young Irish women who are living in the household, Mary A. McIntyre, who's 30, and Anne McKee, who's 30. Um, so I just think it's fascinating to think about um, sort of neighborhoods within neighborhoods. So if we think of Court Street as being the main thoroughfare of Plymouth, um, you know, this, the site where there were, were many grand houses in the 19th century, but you also have this Irish neighborhood right, right within that, um, that neighborhood of these old Yankee families. So I think of the two Irish women um, in the Thomas Hedge House and the two Irish women in the Isaac Lothrop Hedge House, um, and I'm sure they must have known each other. Um, it's, it's interesting to think about how they might have interacted and what they might have done um, together, or at least um, you know, conversations they might have had. Um, we don't know very much about them. So there's lots of scope for further research um, that you'll see throughout this presentation as we go. Now, some of you, if you're very familiar with Plymouth, you might be thinking, well, isn't that nice for these young Catholic women who, or excuse me, young Irish women who um, most likely were Catholic, most of the immigrants coming from Ireland were, were Catholic, um, but it, wouldn't it be nice for them to be in the hedge houses because they're right across the street from um, St. Peter's Church, the Catholic Church in Plymouth. Um, and here it is in a postcard view from around 1912. Um, now, we have to remember that construction of St. Peter's did not actually start until 1873. So at the time of the 1850 census, um, when we have Irish servants living in the hedge houses, um, the church was not there. And in fact, Plymouth did not have a Catholic church until this church was built in 1873. So the nearest Catholic settlement um, where there was an established church uh, and a church building was actually in Sandwich. And um, the church building was constructed there in 1830 when there were 70 parishioners. And by 1848, the congregation employed, could employ a full-time resident priest. And his responsibility stretched not just um, in Sandwich and the Cape Cod, um, but also uh, the, all of the islands, um, Plymouth and Middleborough. So he had quite a lot of territory to cover. Um, so some would travel down from Plymouth to Sandwich for mass on Sunday. Um, others would have um, not had that, not been able to do that. Um, and so they uh, would have observed, um, or well, they wouldn't have observed mass without a priest, but they would have met together in, in their private homes, um, perhaps to, to read and pray together. Um, uh, we know that in 1849, Father John Rodin from Quincy came down and celebrated mass in Plymouth, but of course the church building was not erected then. Um, and then around 1850, Father William Moran began coming to Plymouth from Sandwich um, once every three months to administer um, the sacraments of baptism and penance and marriage. And then he would hold mass on Sunday at the town hall, the Plymouth town hall. Um, and then Father Moran is replaced um, by Father Peter Bertoldi, who is Italian, and in 1864. And so he came, started coming once a month to administer the sacraments and celebrate Mass in Town Hall. And sometimes um, he would celebrate Mass um, in Davis Hall, which is on Main Street. So we have um, definitely, we know that there are Irish immigrants in Plymouth, and we know that many of them were Catholic because they did. Um, you know, have, have Father Moran come and then Father Bertoli come um, to, to um, celebrate Mass. Um, but again, this church was not built until 1873. So that leads us um, to our next neighborhood. So our first neighborhood is this neighborhood within the neighborhood where throughout Plymouth, throughout downtown Plymouth, you do have Irish women working in these um, wealthier households. You also have a lot of immigrants who um, are, especially if they might be um, single men or women, they might be boarding with um, within other households. So you, you know, throughout the town. But um, really the, the neighborhood we know where many of um, the Irish immigrants actually settled and sort of um, lived in, in larger numbers um, was near the waterfront and in the area that we call today um, in the Bradford Street, Union Street area. So Plymouth in um, 1850 was really much less spread out. The population was much less spread out than it is today. Most people did live in the downtown area. 
Um, we had a number of, of villages throughout the town. So there were um, groups of people who lived outside of the downtown waterfront area, but um, the bulk of the population is right here. Um, and immigrant men in particular were um, predominantly laborers. So Irish immigrants were predominantly laborers. They needed to be closer to their workplaces. Um, we know that only four men um, born in Ireland who are listed as farmers in the 1850 census, and two of those actually worked for Benjamin Marston Watson at his hillside estate, sort of um, just west of downtown on Summer Street. So most of these Irish immigrants are not going into farming. Again, as I mentioned earlier, they're, they, they're poor. When they, when they immigrate, it's really, they have nothing. They're coming um, as a last resort because um, to stay would, um, would in many cases mean starvation. Um, so they are looking for places to work and they need to be close to those places of work. Um, this is not an age when people are commuting <laughs> great distances um, for their jobs. So in the 1830s and 1840s, Irish immigrants um, begin to, to live and in, in, in center, the center of the Irish community is really this um, Bradford Street area. Um, the map we're looking at is actually from 1874. So this is a map by J.B. Beers and Company. Um, and it's uh, reproduced, the digital reproduction is just wonderful because you can zoom right in, but that's courtesy of the Norman B. Leventhal Map and Education Center at the Boston Public Library. So they have some wonderful maps at Plymouth. This 1874 map is the best map to illustrate um, the neighborhoods that I'll be talking about, um, even though it's, it's obviously later than eight, the 1850 census. Um, but it, just to, if you're familiar with Plymouth, to orient you, you can see um, that here we have the town brook. We ha well, we have the harbor, first of all. That's probably the easiest way to orient you on the right side of this um, map detail. So that's east, roughly east. Um, and you can see a, a large body of water that's, um, you know, sort of leading west from the harbor. And that's actually town brook. Um, and so that was when Town Brook was dammed and there was a mill pond there. Um, and so, so we're looking at the area that's south of Town Brook. And if you look um, sort of at the bottom left corner of the map detail, you can see that green space, which is the training green where the Soldiers and Sailors Monument for the Civil War Memorial is located. Um, and that is still open space today. So we're looking at the area south of Town Brook and east of um, the training green, east, east of Sandwich Street. And what you can see here is Commercial Street um, is known today as Bradford Street. It was originally Commercial Street. So that is one of the um, sort of the, the backbone of this neighborhood. And then um, we have Emerald Street, which, uh, which connects Commercial or, or Bradford Street and Water Street. It's a very short street. Emerald Street was previously known as Smith lane and this is a you know a very very old neighborhood um you can see that the, it's very convenient to um the lumber yard you have a lumber yard on the harbor you have the number of wharves that stretched out into plymouth harbor you have the plymouth iron foundry that we can see just right here in this detail there's a fish yard there um, so this is a really great place to live if you have any sort of connection to these um businesses on the waterfront or of course if you have any connection to the sea um, and so Bradford Street as it's known today um, was home to many um, fishermen and other sailors. Um, here we have uh, photographs that I took so this is what Emerald Street looks like today. Um, it, this is the end of it that is at Bradford Street um, and then, oops, sorry. So on the left, it's the end on Bradford Street and on the right, it's the end um, from Water Street. So you're, you might be familiar with the Water Street end of um, Emerald Street because it's, it's right next to the Water Street Cafe's parking area. Um, it doesn't really look like um, too much of a street today. Um, it looks more like a driveway, but that, that is Emerald Street. And we know that some of those families, the, those Irish families who were gathering together in their, their homes um, were right on um, Emerald Street. And then here's just a, a view of Bradford Street. Again, you can get a sense of um, the small size of these houses. Most of the houses on Bradford Street, um, you know, built for by um, fishermen, other sailors, um, and then people who are working in these waterfront industries came to live there as well. So um, this is a, it's, I, I love walking down Bradford Street. It's, it's really fascinating to see that um, early 19th century architecture that survives there. 
Now, um, again, if we look at this um, 1874 map, we have the house name the, or the owners of the houses actually um, included on, on this map, which is one reason why I love it, because if you're looking for someone in particular or you're wondering who lived in a house, you can refer to this map. Um, but that doesn't help us with the 1850 census, <laughs> but it um, did um, sort of spark some connections in my mind with some of the stories we know about um, the uh, Irish immigrant families in Plymouth. So if you look right here on the south side of Commercial Street, or which is now Bradford Street, we have um, a house and the name there is J. Burns. And so I've drawn an arrow here that's, um, I think it's number 35 Bradford Street today. So a rather small house right there. This is looking up Bradford Street from um, Union Street. And I am, again, I, sh I um, have to be honest, I, I, I'm doing a little bit of speculation here because I'm not sure if the Jay Burns that lived in 1874 on Bradford Street um, is the James Burns who I want to talk to you about today. But based on the census records, it does seem that it's likely that this Burns family from the 1850 census is living in that Bradford Union Street area. There's a lot of um, other um, immigrants who are in that same area. There's a lot of Irish names and as well as a lot of, again, people who are working as, as sailors or as they call them in the census, um, seamen. Um, but here we have a record for a, a James Barnes, which I believe is incorrect um, because the names here for this family and the ages and all the other details match up with um, the James Burns family. So here's a case where the census taker probably um, made a mistake and heard James Barnes, even though it was James Burns. So James Burns is listed, he's 36 at the time of the census. He's a blacksmith and he was born in Ireland as were his wife, Mary, 41, um, and his daughter, Sarah, who is two. However, you can see that there's also a son in this household, James H. Burns, who is just three months old when the census is taken. And his birthplace, interestingly enough, is listed as Plymouth, Massachusetts. Now, for most of the birthplaces in the 1850 census, um, it would just say Massachusetts. It wouldn't specify Plymouth, Massachusetts. But I think um, it may have been that James Burns, um, you know, who, who this immigrant from Ireland and his wife, Mary, may have wanted to emphasize that their son, James, was born right here in Plymouth. Now, the reason why this family name stood out to me and I wanted to include them on today's tour is because um, we do get a sense of, um, well, unfortunately, it's, it's actually a very tragic story. And it's one that if you've been on Burial Hill, you may um, be familiar with. So Burial Hill, the historic burying ground at the center of the Plymouth downtown, um, we see this small marble obelisk. So this is sort of on the, the western, the back side of Burial Hill. Um, not actually not too far from the Cushman Memorial, the Cush large obelisk that's the Cushman family monument. Um, we have this small marble obelisk with this um, plain cross on it. And this is the grave of um, James and Mary Byrne, who, who um, we, James and Mary Burns, um, who we saw in the 1850 census. It's also the grave um, before their deaths, it was the grave of um, a number of their children who tragically died, um, drowned at Manomet Point um, on November 20th, 1848. And their names are listed, Ellen, aged 11, Catherine, aged nine, Henry, aged seven, Mary, aged five, and Rose, aged three. Um, and we know there are, there are many newspaper accounts of this um, shipwreck and the, the tragic deaths of these children. Um, we know that um, the, the, it was the schooner Welcome Return that was um, actually the captain was Captain Hewitt out of Halifax, Nova Scotia, um, and the ship was sailing from Prince Edward Island down to Boston. So um, we're not quite sure, but possibly the Burns family could have um, been coming to um, Massachusetts by way of um, PEI um, after coming from Ireland, um, or it's possible that Perhaps they lived in um, PEI or lived in the Maritimes for a time before deciding to immigrate the rest of the way to um, Boston. But in any case, the um, schooner goes aground uh, um, about five o'clock and there were five crewmen and 12 passengers. Um, the passengers included one woman who was Mary Burns 
and um, six children, all under 12. Um, the men actually all reached, reached the shore and were able to find refuge in, in the house there of um, a Mr. Hayward. Um, but unfortunately, um, they, the children did not reach shore. And so the old colony reported, again, this is November of 1848, some persons who saw the vessel coming up on the breakers went down to the spot where she struck and her hearing a cry on board succeeded in getting upon the wreck, the mast having fallen in such a way as to facilitate their doing so. They found the woman nearly or quite insensible with the infant in her arms unhurt and the five older children dead, having been killed by the falling of the mast and the shifting of the lumber which composed the cargo. And the author of this uh, news report goes on, it has been thought singular that the men should have deserted the wreck, leaving the woman and child uh, the ch and children on board. So um, the, the men really are, um, are held up, um, you know, for, for some, some serious condemnation in the newspaper reports that they actually left this woman and her children on the ship. Um, although it, it does note that it was assumed that they were already dead. Um, and they note that the husband and father, who is James Burns, was so stupefied and benumbed by the sufferings that, the ha that he had to be guided by a Newfoundland dog owned by the ship's captain to safety. Um, so certainly this was a, a horrific moment for this family, a t terrible tragedy. It was, it was horrific to anyone who witnessed it. Um, so thankfully, because the, the people on shore heard the cries, they did go and they rescued Mary, the mother and um, her newborn child, her young infant, and they were able to bring them safely to land. Um, the children who died, their bodies were brought to the Plymouth Town Hall and they were buried from First Church um, right here on Burial Hill. So when we look at that census record, um, we have, you know, a sort of the stark reality that two years after the shipwreck that brought James and Mary Burns to Plymouth, um, we have them staying in Plymouth. And um, Sarah, who was that, that young infant who was saved from the shipwreck, she's now two years old. Um, and then since coming to Plymouth, they have um, a son who they named James and he is just three months old. So born in 1850, two years after the shipwreck that claimed his siblings live, lives. Um, so again, so we have really a, a, a picture here of the, the incredible challenges and obstacles and potential for, for tragedy, personal and family tragedy that immigrants um, underwent and had to overcome when they came to the United States. So um, the, the sea voyage was, was not um, easy. There were, of course, many risks by traveling um, across the Atlantic. And then um, here, here in Plymouth, you know, ha crashing on those hazardous rocks. Um, they did stay and they did ha have more children. Um, sadly though, um, this James who was born in 1850, he actually is killed when he's just 21 years old. Um, he was a locomotive fireman um, on the Eastern Railway Company and he was, was killed. And so um, in, in 1871, so he's, he was, must have been a, you know, a sort of a, adding an, a light to the home when he was born after the loss of the other children. And then that light was snuffed out by another tragic accident um, 21 years later. Um, so again, for these Irish immigrants who are coming, obviously James has a, um, a, a he's skilled, he's a blacksmith, um, but for others who had nothing and the labor is hard and there are many risks, um, and not just with coming, but then in the work that's being done. So that's part of that immigrant story here in Plymouth as well. Um, we know that Mary Burns died in 1867 when she was just 54, and James, the father, died in 1878 when he was 66. So I don't know if that house on um, what's now Bradford Street was where they were living. Um, uh, I'm, I'm going to have to do some further research into property records to see if I can pinpoint pin that down a little bit more. But it's sort of interesting to think again about this Irish immigrant community um, right there in that area. And then here's an example of, of an Irish immigrant family and what they endured as they came to Plymouth. All right, so we're going to move to another neighborhood. 
And this one is in North Plymouth, although again, I'm pulling up that 1874 map of Plymouth. This is an inset in the map that's highlighting the area that they call Seaside. So Seaside was the name of what we call North Plymouth today. And um, you can see at the very top of this map detail that is the Seaside train station. So there was the train station that stopped right there. Um, it's right at the Kingston line. And then at the, uh, the harbor, of course, on the right side of the map, so that's east to orient you. And the railroad, the Old Colony Railroad, um, went from the Seaside Station right into downtown Plymouth to the main train station. And here we have um, really the reason why this is highlighted on the map, I think, is because it's the, the location of the Plymouth Cordage Company. So you can see that we have um, a very, very long building that takes up most of this map detail, and that's the, um, the Plymouth Cordage Company's works. And that Cordage Company was founded in 1824 by Born Spooner, a major rope making company. Um, rope initially needed to um, outfit all of the sailing vessels that are coming in and out in Plymouth and other areas. Um, but uh, the cordage company sort of continues to to produce cordage for all sorts of purposes um, right into the 1960s. So it's a very long lived um, and very, very influential employer um, to and, and influential in shaping really the, the demographics of Plymouth as we know our town today. So originally when Born Spooner decides to start his cordage company in um, Seaside, um, it's a pretty isolated area. And so he um, plans housing for his workforce because he needs, you know, they, again, the workers aren't able to commute. They need a place where they could live that's near their place of employ. So Born Spooner decides well, he'll build houses for them where they can rent and they can live um, and they'll be right where he can keep an eye on them and he can um, make sure they're they're on the spot for their jobs. Um, and so gradually what ends up happening is initially, initially um, I should say, um, this is not an immigrant workforce. These are uh, native born uh, Americans, many of them, you know, they're, they're of English descent. Um, and probably there's about 50 of them to begin with. And then as the company grows, the workforce needs to grow and there's therefore an increased need for housing. So more housing is built by the company and increasingly um, they employ immigrants to work in the cordage company as well. So you have a, a gradual shift towards housing um, that is really now in many ways um, mostly being occupied by um, you know, people from other countries. Um, and so I just wanted to, to um, thank Lucille Leary, who's the, um, at the Plymouth Cordage Historical Society. So Lucille has been a great help. She helped me with um, sort of trying to identify some of the houses um, here in the, the seaside area that I'm going to talk about. So I flipped the map. <laughs> I hope that doesn't, um, you have to reorient yourself now. So instead of um, looking at it with um, north um, on the top, we're now looking at north on the right side of the screen. So there's the Kingston line is on the right side of the map. Um, the harbor is at the bottom of the, the image. Um, and so we can sort of get a better sense now of, of the, the houses and the other buildings here in Seaside. And I just want to highlight a couple. So here, um, circled in red on the far left, is um, a house, a single family home. It's labeled with the name C.W. Spooner, Charles W. Spooner. Um, that is actually the son of Born Spooner. Um, so he, in 1874, owns the house, um, although, of course, in 1850, Born Spooner was still alive. He does not die until 1870. Um, so he is, um, so this was in 1850, that was Born Spooner's house. And today it is um, one of the locations for the Cartmel Davis funeral and cremation. And um, I just wanted to, to add a little um, thank you to them because Cartmel Davis is one of our sponsors through a co corporate sponsorship program at the Antiquarian Society this year. They're a bronze sponsor. So thanks, thanks to them for supporting us um, this year. But here we have the Born Spooner House, um, later where Charles, his son lived with his family. And then if we look further down, um, we sort of skip um, 
a large parcel of land owned by Thomas Jackson. And I've circled and read um, a large dwelling house um, that's right on Court Street. It's actually um, the first number in the sequence is 413 Court Street, and it's a six family um, dwelling house, which looks like this. And um, we think that this is probably one of the earliest houses, um, worker, workers houses that was built by the Cordage Company. Um, again, they begin building workers housing in 1820s, 1830s, 1840s. Um, so this would definitely have been there in 1850 when the census was taken. And then it sits at the corner of um, Rope Walk Court. So I want to share another little house, or rather large house, that's on Rope, work, rope Walk Court. And as you can see from Court Street, if you followed Rope Walk Court, you'd, you'd really end up right at the Cordage Company's um, works. So if you were working there, it's a great place to be. You have a very short walk to get to the office. It's not, not an office for you. <laughs> but here is um, that building, which was circled on the map. Um, again, one of these very early um, uh, examples of workers housing made by the Cordage Company. And if we go back to the map, you can see there um, across Court Street from these two buildings, there's um, a number of structures that are labeled Cordage Company tenements. Um, and so the Cordage Company, as I said earlier, continues to build. So I'm trying to focus on these two because um, that was really, uh, they would have been there in 1850. Some of the others came later. And then because the Cordage Company was in operation through the 1960s, you have pretty much all of North Plymouth really being um, developed as a result of the Cordage Company's presence there, either because the, co the company is building the housing for their workers or um, other buildings are being built in response to the, the population that's now there, when before there really weren't that many people in Seaside. So what, so, so what about the people who lived in these houses? So eight, what can the 1850 census tell us about them? And again, I can't pinpoint exactly who lived in which house, um, but I do know that on the census, we, we have Born Spooner's household listed. So we know he lives on Court Street and then the next um, uh, house is another Spooner family, single family dwelling. And then we have dwelling number 270 on the 1850 census actually lists four families. And all of the families, um, either one or both, usually both of the parents were born in Germany. Most of the children were born in Germany, although um, some of them are listed as being born in Massachusetts. So these, this is a house where you have, um, you know, one of those four, four family units um, and they are um, German immigrants living in the house. Some of them have been there long enough that their younger children have been born in, in Massachusetts. Um, dwelling number 271 um, on the 1850 census includes four families and two single men. So you basically have six separate family units if you count the single men as, as two family units. Um, and so again, these are all German families except for some children who were born in the United States. Um, and I'm highlighting here um, one of the families in that um, dwelling number 271. Um, and the name is Caspar Klingenhagen. Um, who is listed as a laborer and he's 23 years old and his wife Mary is um, also listed with him and she was 22 at the time of the census, both born in Germany and in 1850 they did not have any children. Um, so we don't, we don't know for sure, again I can't say for sure that um, that the Klingenhagens and that dwelling number 271 matches up with this house here on Court Street. We do know that in the um, 1860 directory of the town of Plymouth, Casper um, Klingenhagen is listed as living on Court Street. So it could be that he was living in Cordage Company housing, um, but it seems that it, it might, might have been because again, six families listed, this is a six um, unit building. But why did I um, pick Casper to highlight here. Um, well, again, because it's a name familiar to us from our Burial Hill tours, here is Casper's um, grave on Burial Hill. He died in 1893. Um, and we know that, um, so he, he's an example of um, these German immigrants who came to Plymouth 
um, specifically to work in the cordage company. So um, in the 1850 census, he's just listed as a laborer. However, um, in the 1860 town director, he's actually listed as a rope maker. So often um, these workers would identify as being rope makers, um, you know, and again, they're really um, holding on to that, um, that industry that is that has brought them to the United States. Um, and so he might have actually, you know, risen in the rank. So maybe he was just sort of a more general laborer to begin with. And then, um, you know, he, he becomes a rope make maker with perhaps more responsibility um, over the course of his employment, but he is employed by the cordage company. Um, and we, we know um, the Klingenhagen name in particular because um, Anna Klingenhagen, um, Casper's daughter, um, who was born in North Plymouth in 1869, was actually the last person buried on Burial Hill when she was buried in 1957. Um, and I think Anna is an example of um, sort of the, when we think of the immigrant story and we can think of, of again, with the Burns family, the challenges that immigrants faced, um, the tragedies that sometimes befell them, um, but when we think of um, Anna Klingenhagen, we can think of some of the, the opportunities that were opened, particularly to the second generation and then the third generation of these immigrant families. Um, so Anna graduated from Plymouth High School at the age of 15. She was the valedictorian of her class, uh, the class of 1884. She, um, she's a teacher for a time, then she goes on to college. Eventually she um, is studies at Wellesley College. Um, and then she graduates and goes on to the University of Chicago. Um, where she receives a master's degree in philosophy in 1900. Um, and she's hired as a professor of history at the University of Iowa. And then in 1909, she's appointed the Dean of the College of Women at the University of Iowa. And then in 1919, 10 years later, um, she is appointed Dean of Women at Oberlin College in Ohio. So here we have her, her gravestone on Burial Hill and then a photograph of her. Um, so again, um, you know, the life of an immigrant was, was full of risks and was challenging and was difficult. Um, but one of those pull factors bringing them to the United States was the, 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 you know, the promise of a better life and the promise of new opportunities. And in some cases, um, often the, the second generation benefited from, from those opportunities. So um, when we were talking about the Irish community in Plymouth, we talked a little bit about the um, Catholic Church in St. Peter's. Uh, many of the German immigrants who come to work at the Cordage Company in the 1850s are um, Lutherans. And so they, this is a, a new denomination that you, there, were, there weren't um, many <laughs> Lutherans in Plymouth proper um, before you have a large German population. Um, but the, Germans, uh, the German immigrants eventually do um, build their own Lutheran church. So that's what's photographed here. We have, um, it's now the Zion Evangelical Lutheran Church um, in 1850, uh, or well, it wasn't built in 1850, but in the 19th century, it would have been known as the, Z the German Lutheran Church. So um, really identified with that German immigrant population. The building itself was, was built sometime at the end of the 19th century, very end of the 19th century or around 1900. Um, and we see here the building that's attached to the church is actually the former Loring Library, which was built across the street. This is Court Street across the street um, for cordage workers. It was a, a library built by the company for the workers. And it was moved um, to the site next to the um, Zion Church um, to save it from demolition. And so it, uh, it, it's a function space par parish center there now. Um, so we do have um, Germans, you know, again, coming to Plymouth in the 1850s, many of them working at the Cordage Company, living in that workers housing, and then um, eventually building their own church, um, just as, you know, the, the growth of the Catholic population, primarily through the, the Irish, and um, led to the um, building of St. Peter's downtown. Okay, so what happens then after 1850? So we've looked at this 1850 census, we've looked at the 1874 map, we've talked about some of these, these two neighborhoods, the Irish and the German um, communities. Um, 
after the Civil War, so after the 1860s, um, we see a dramatic increase in industrialization in the United States. The Cordage Company and other companies in Plymouth, um, they, they grow and they continue to require more and more workers. Um, and so we have actually a new source of immigrants. Um, they're coming from Southern and Eastern Europe. And this is, again, paralleling what's happening elsewhere in the country. And so we actually have some new immigrant neighborhoods um, being created, although often um, the new immigrants move into the neighborhoods that were um, occupied by the older immigrant groups. So as, you know, um, families establish themselves, there, there might be some upward mobility there. Um, they might be able to move into other parts of Plymouth. Um, uh, so their, their older housing is, is now available to, to newcomers. Um, and again, it has the same benefits. You want to be close to your, your place of employment and you, you know, so, so we have some turnover in that sense. Um, so what sort of, we talked about the Irish community based on that in that Bradford street area. Um, we know that, um, by 1900, the foot of Leiden street. So just, just north of town Brook, um, was known as little Italy. So we do have an increasing number of Italian immigrants. Um, many, many more Italian immigrants come to Plymouth in the um, post-Civil War years. Um, so court, the Cordage Workers Housing that is continued to be that continues to be built in North Plymouth, um, most of those housing is now for Italian families and, and individuals. And then um, we also have um, a, a small uh, Jewish population of, of immigrants coming from um, Eastern and Southern Europe. Um, and uh, many of them settled in the, the Summer Street area. So again, that's unfortunately a neighborhood that has been demolished, Summer Street, High Street area, um, behind sort of um, the north side of Summer Street, sort of behind Town Square, where um, there was an old 18th century um, neighborhood, um, 18th, 19th century houses torn down in the 1960s in the name of urban renewal. Um, but many of those older houses were occupied by some of these newer immigrants in the later 19th century and the early 20th century. Um, so, so, and then when they, when that wave of immigrants, um, you know, has, has some time, the next wave uh, we have of Cape Verdeans who are coming in, in, in a similar period. Um, and then, you know, we generally, again, sometimes these immigrant neighborhoods become a new immigrant or remain immigrant neighborhoods, but it's just a new immigrant population. Okay, so I've reached the end of my talk. I have um, five minutes. Oh, I actually good. So I have a chance to um, to look at some of the comments, and we have a comment about the um, the Klingenhagens. Let me go back to that gravestone. Um, so in the 1850 cen census, Marie um, or Mary was one year younger than her husband. So she's listed as being 22, um, which means she would have been um, born, I think, around 1828 or something like that. Um, or 1825, I guess, based on Casper's birth date. Um, and then on the gravestone, um, the, the birth date for Marie is, is significantly later than Casper. So um, Mary, that first wife who's listed here, um, we believe she died. Um, so she was um, Anna's mother, and then um, Casper married again. So um, again, that's one of the things about the census records is sometimes um, names are recorded sort of in standardized English, you know, because the census taker is more than likely to be an English speaker. Um, so Mary, Marie, those could have been, could have been recorded interchangeably. Um, we have a lot of um, repeated names as well, popular names used in different, um, for, for, for different immigrant populations. So, and Mary being one of them. Um, so it, it does get a little confusing there, which is why you should never stop with just the census records. And it's good to always double check and say um, what happened with the, um, if you can see birth records and death records and wedding records, marriage records, if you can look at gravestones. Um, again, you can, you sort of have to do all of that extra research because you don't want to just trust the census alone and see um, what has changed from, again, one census to the next or um, from one 
one record to the next. I'm um, just looking to see if we have any other questions that came up while I was talking. Um, I don't see any other questions and I'm um, wanted to share one last thing. It's not um, it's not related to immigrant neighborhoods, but we do have the Antiquarian Summer Fair coming up at the end of this month, um, Saturday, August 28th. So this is our uh, traditional, it's a fundraiser for us. It's a um, long-standing tradition. We hold it the same day as the Plymouth Chamber of Commerce's Waterfront Festival, um, but we're on the Hedge House lawn instead of on Water Street. Well, the Hedge House is on Water Street. We're on our lawn. Um, the Waterfront Festival is down closer to Pilgrim Memorial State Park. Um, but if you if you've been missing the summer fair, know that we will we will be there on Saturday, August 28th, unless conditions change. But at this point, we are planning to have the fair. Um, it will be somewhat scaled back. So um, normally we have a lot of um, donations that we receive, and then we were able to sell those items. Um, we have a, um, other tables with other sorts of items that we sell. Um, so we have are not asking for donations this year. We're keeping it smaller. Uh, and we'll be selling um, sort of vintage items and attic treasures as we call them. Um, but we some some of our um, some things we will not be selling just because of um, the pandemic. So I hope you can come. I hope you can enjoy it. Um, we will have the Hedge House open for tours and we're hoping to have a special children's activity area. So if you have kids or grandkids, um, feel free to to bring them along and stay tuned for more details on our website, PlymouthAntiquarian.org for, um, for those details and for the recordings of all of our virtual programs. And again, if you have any questions, feel free to leave them on the Facebook um, comment section and I'll go back and read them and respond to them um, when I finish this. So thanks everyone, have a wonderful afternoon. And um, we're so, so glad that you are joining us today.